France has a president who's big on remembrance. Emmanuel Macron's put historians to work on Algeria and Rwanda. He's called for conversations on colonialism and slavery. Now, though, exactly a year before the presidential election, Macron going all in on Napoleon with a wreath-laying ceremony at the emperor's tomb at Paris's Les Invalides Armory. His government insists the uh, 200th anniversary of Napoleon's death is a commemoration, not a celebration. We'll ask our panel about that and the legacy of Napoleon Bonaparte, a reformer who modernized the state or a tyrant who cracked down on dissent and rolled back freedoms of the born of the French Revolution. Every era, of course, sees Napoleon in a different light. And French history is regularly infused with calls for prov providential, larger-than-life figures. Macron himself, when he was elected back in 2017, promised a Jupiterian presidency when he succeeded leaders that were deemed too weak uh, by voters. But is another Napoleon what the French really want this time? Today in the France 24 debate, uh, we're looking at Napoleon's legacy under scrutiny. With us, historian Peter Hicks of the uh, Fondation Napoleon Historical Society. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. Uh, from Chichester, we welcome back Andrew Smith, senior lecturer in contemporary history and politics at the University of Chichester. Thanks for, thanks for joining us. Thank you. And uh, from Charlottesville, Virginia, Marlene Dot, associate professor of African Diaspora Studies at the University of Virginia. Welcome to the show. The France 24 debate on Facebook and on Twitter, hashtag F24Debate. Uh, before we go to our panel, let's cross to France 24's Claire Bacalin, who is outside the uh, Invalide, where that ceremony took place just a short while ago. And it was a typical Emmanuel Macron speech when it comes uh, to history. Uh, and that is to say, tr trying to take the long view with uh, a lot of uh, speak about what it means to hold the kind of power that Napoleon did. Absolutely. Emmanuel Macron started by looking at the darker aspects of Napoleon's legacy. He said that he had a disregard for human life when it came to the Napoleonic Wars. Millions died on and off the battlefield. He also said that Napoleon's decision to reinstate slavery was wrong, that it was a mistake, and it was a betrayal of the values of the Enlightenment. Well, that was looking at the darker aspects of Napoleon's legacy, and Emmanuel Macron also de dedicated a large chunk of his speech to looking at how Napoleon reformed France and how those reforms to the education system, the political system, the legal system, how they are still very much visible today. And the message the president was really trying to push was that he believes that France can move forward and has always moved forward by learning from its past and not erasing it. Now, we can listen to an extract from that speech now. De l'Empire. We've denounced the worst of the empire and embellished the best of the emperor. On this bicentennial commemoration, let us remember to not give in to the temptation to look at history anachronistically, that is, to judge the past with the values of the present. Don't give in to looking at history anachronistically, says Macron, but of course, he's looking at it through 2021 eyes, perhaps with an eye to 2022. That's a very good point, Francois. Let's not forget, in a year's time, there's a presidential election here in France. And Emmanuel Macron is well rehearsed now, when it rehearsed now, when it comes to trying to attract members of the left wing as well as the right wing. And in this speech today, we saw him trying not to alienate critics of Napoleon and also not anger fans of Napoleon, because of course he wants them all to vote for him in a year's time. He said to some of the high school students who were sitting in the audience, who, by the way, will soon be sitting the baccalaureate, the end of school exam that Napoleon himself put in place here in France. He said that you can like, you can criticize, but above all, you need to learn. It's worth remembering as well that Emmanuel Macron spoke about Napoleon as someone who helped structure France, 
all de France as it was coming out of the ashes and the chaos of the revolution. But also at that time, Napoleon reversed some of the gains that have been made in women's rights after the revolution. And also he reversed some of those precious steps towards democracy. So certainly a, a controversial figure, genius, tyrant, power-hungry, dictator, reformer. He was probably all of those things. But Emmanuel Macron certainly eyeing the election in 2022. Peter Higgs, but many thanks uh, for that. Claire Pacalin with, uh, with uh, that live update there uh, after that speech at the Invalide by, uh, by Emmanuel Macron. Listening to the speech, did you get a sense of how much President Macron is a Napoleon lover? Well, I don't think he's a Napoleon lover. I think he's a respecter of Napoleon. And I think what I draw out of the speech was how... Um, I like this idea of not being anachronistic. I like being judging the past by the times, by the time, by the time itself, and uh, that seems to me rational and not emotional. He's being sensible about that, in my opinion. That's that seems to me a a cool, calm, uh, equable way to view history. He didn't have to do this, right? He didn't have to go all in. No, indeed. Uh, which is indeed interesting when you see the previous presidents who seem to find Napoleon a little bit too difficult. Maybe the fact that Macron is halfway across the right as he is across the left, that means that he has he's sort of taken part of the voters from the right. So he's got to keep them sweet. So he's going to keep those people on board. Andrew Smith, why did he do it? Why the, why the, the, the big uh, ceremony, which, by the way, also included a speech by... Uh, uh, a former president, Nicolas Sarkozy, and that leaf reef laying ceremony. Why? Well, I think it's it's important, isn't it, to see the way that um, Emmanuel Macron has always um, played with these these symbols of the national past and this this idea we mentioned there in the VT, the idea of the providential man. This this idea has been recurrent within within Macron's presidency. You know, of course, he mentioned in his speech the idea that uh, Napoleon transcended the divides of the republic, not just by by reconciling those warring tribes, as it were, but by kind of moving beyond them. And that's, of course, what he's always cast uh, the République en marche as trying to do. Um, so I think, you know, as we've heard there, this very much plays to um, to his right-wing support, um, to the right-wing support which he is, is courting. I think we can see from political moves recently that uh, this is very much about positioning himself um, on that kind of sovereignist side of, of history. Um, but I think this is important as well. He put his own stamp on it. He redefined his own image of Napoleon as well. Of course, he mentioned it to high school students and the Institute. Um, it was about this idea of education as much as it was about commemoration. I think, importantly, this idea of kind of the, this, this distinct he put up about commemoration and celebration. Of course, this is the classic Macroniste en même temps. Um, he was at once playing with those symbols, playing with the ideas, making himself a sort of uh, you know Napoleon, uh, Napoleonic figure, as it were, while at the same time acknowledging those difficulties in the general's legacy. So I think there's there's a lot of uh, difficulties there in terms of understanding you know myth, man. Uh, movement, all these kind of things around it. So for Macron, I think it is very politically opportune and very important to do this, and but not uncontroversial, um, I think, as you pointed out there as well. Uh, Marlene Dowd, the en même temps, at the same time, that was a refrain we heard from Macron on the campaign trail in 2017, saying he'd take the best ideas from the left, the best ideas from the right. How balanced do you think that speech was? I mean, I really, to be honest, don't, find that it was very balanced at all. I mean, so much of the language that he used about lumière and liberté, which are really huge anachronisms when speaking about Napoleon, because, you know, I'm a person who does judge Napoleon by the standards of his time. The people of Haiti um, in Saint-Domingue called him the usurper of Europe. They recognized that he had tried to commit a genocide with his troops during the Leclerc expedition. And the fact of the matter is that Napoleon was one of the worst men of his time. Um, and we should be celebrating and commemorating people who were among the best men and women of their time. Um, the French abolitionists who fought for the end of slavery, who encouraged and debated on the floors of the National Convention, urging them uh, to end slavery after the Haitian revolutionaries had already brought that outcome about in Saint-Domingue in 1793. People like the Abbé Grégoire, Toussaint Verture, all the unnamed tens of thousands of enslaved Africans who stood up and fought for their rights 
Heights in Saint-Domingue, Guadeloupe, and Martinique. So to say that we uh, don't want to judge him anachronistically is to forget that there were plenty of people who disapproved of Napoleon's rule, his reign, his restoration of slavery, and is to say that we want to disregard that and, and prefer uh, a mythology that allows him to continue to be considered a great man despite all the great wrongs. And Marlene, uh, again, I, I asked the question. Back in 2005, France's then president, the Gaullist Jacques Chirac, said he had uh, an African summit to go to in Mali, and he passed on commemorating the bicentennial of Napoleon's victory at Austerlitz against a coalition of armies led by Austria. Uh, he, Macron didn't have to do this. Why did he go so big? Um, I think that a lot of the commentary that I've seen lately in terms of his admiration and images coming out, seeing Nic uh, Macron and the way that he sort of behaves in front of um, Napoleon, Napoleon paraphernalia, suggests to me that there might be true admiration there. So I understand the cynical perspective that says there's an election coming up, but there are also plenty of people um, in France who do still revere Napoleon, and it is quite possible that Macron is simply demonstrating that he is one of those people. Last week, uh, there, there's always this uneasiness, uh, uh, Peter Hicks, because we talk about a reformer, uh, and these are times that call for, and Macron himself calls himself a reformer, and at the same time, this talk of tyrants. And, you know, within living memory, uh, in France, we've had coup leaders. We did with um, when uh, there was, uh, in 1958, um, uh, an attempt to overthrow de Gaulle uh, over Algeria. Mm. Uh, so, again, the, the fact that there is this sort of martial deference to Napoleon, it's still an uneasy subject. Of France. course it's an uneasy subject. I think that's right. I think uh, interesting points have been made. Uh, certainly at the time, Napoleon was not necessarily a figure of, con of uh, consensus, but if you take the coup d'etat, which was not organised by Napoleon, let's not remember this, he is brought in behind a coup d'etat, which was a parliamentary uh, Republican coup d'etat, which in the end was bloodless. Uh, Napoleon comes in as the sort of as the muscle. He's brought in by these politicians. He then becomes the man of consensus. It's interesting to hear uh, we say that uh, there's a lot of anti-consensus to Napoleon. In terms of mainland France, Napoleon is the man of consensus during the, the, the consulate. He couldn't have done it any other way. It depends way. how the question is asked, right? Yes. Because uh, if the question is, uh, do you admire Napoleon? It's not really the question that's asked. The qu question we saw in one poll this, uh, this, this Wednesday was, who's the uh, most important figure in French history, and yeah, Napoleon ranks mm. first. Absolutely. Well, we're not questioning. I think this was something that Macron did indeed talk about: was the question of the difference between celebration and commemoration. He's keen on commemoration. We, as an institution at the Fondation Napoleon, we're keen on commemoration. Uh, I mean, I think you know we're talking about remembering the past, remembering what happens, trying to understand it. Uh, and I think we would agree on that: that uh, if you if you want to commemorate or to remember or to try and see how things worked, you have to go back to the time itself and look at it. Again, and it brings us back to the issue of uh, uh, what France wants today. Uh, and I just want to uh, talk about something that happened last week. The French government announced they were sanctioning 18 active duty soldiers uh, who are among those who'd penned an open letter calling for revolt against the, quote, permissiveness uh, prevailing uh, in uh, today's society. Uh, if nothing is done, uh, ultimately, it will cause an explosion uh, and the intervention of our active comrades, talking about soldiers here, in a perilous mission to protect our civilizational values. That uh, was signed by a host of retired generals. It shocked many, uh, but not all. I can say that I share their concern, I share their assessment, but I think that these problems are fixed through politics and by a project backed by the French people in a democratic context. So coincidence of the calendar, Andrew Smith, at a time when uh, uh, France is uh, talking about what's going on inside of its army and what's going on with its far right, these commemorations, are they, is it pure coincidence that this is all happening right now? Well, I think it's, you know, it obviously puts a, a different slant on these kind of discussions. Um, of course, this this letter from the, uh, you know, re retired generals and from these other kind of soldiers that signed up as well um, did 
suggests some very worrying things. And I think there's been some worrying echoes, uh, both from the, the, the far right, the Rassemblement National, but also from the Républicain, people like Dati, of course, we just um, heard from, I think, we just uh, was a, a few Pen, moments ago. Um, this idea that the military should play some kind of role Okay, um, sorry. Well, you had Marion uh, Marichal Le Pen talked about uh, the need for the military in public debates. Uh, Veronique Dati talked about the idea of urban guerrilla warfare. You had Marion uh, uh, Marion Le Pen, um, Marine Le Pen, excuse me, talking about ideas of how they're moving forward and looking at these ideas. You had somebody like uh, Robert Menard and Bézier talking about this idea of you know sending the army into the suburbs. This is, of course, a hot button issue where we have people on the far right mobilising to support these kind of ideas. And I think that is something that's really crucial because whatever clip we play from anyone across that spectrum that puts a very different um significant i think inflection on a commemoration like this i think as marlene said there's an importance that we don't just say okay napoleon the greatest general there we go fantastic that's what we're talking about and nothing else there's an importance to look alongside it at a nuanced view i think this idea that we don't judge things by the standards of you know one period of time is is fine but i think it can be a bit of a canard as well this has always been a, a kind of a contentious figure. Napoleon always met with resistance. You know, we might look at, of course, the centenary and look at the opposition papers, which, you know, uh, cursed his name in 1921. And we could look at, you know, even in 2005, you mentioned uh, Chirac. Uh, he was called out by people in his party for boycotting the uh, the centenary of Austerlitz and, you know, uh, bowing to um, political correctness, uh, the bicentennial, of course, sorry. Um, but I think these are kind of important ideas about how we understand, you know, the complexity of history. Um, Sudhir so Hazabi Singh wrote a wonderful um, article based on his book, or leading to his book, where he talks about the way that, you know, the, the myth of Napoleon develops during the Restoration, how it gets this kind of political traction. And Annie Jordan as well has talked about ideas of how, you know, Napoleon himself saw himself as someone who was writing history at the time, that he wanted to kind of take the time to write history. He was someone who was aware of his own kind of mythology as much as anything else. And so I think this is very much about symbols. This is very much about play to a certain sovereigntist, civilizationist idea of what the kind of movement behind the man means. I don't think uh, Macron sees himself as a Bonapartist in any kind of grand boulanger style um, approach. But I do think, you know, as Marlene said, he probably sees some admiration in the man. He sees him as a figure, an incarnation of a certain idea of Frenchness. I think there is something really important there. But it's also significant in terms of the calendar, not just the general's letter, but also Macron's going to go and he's going to have, you know, what the day of Europe next Saturday. He's then going to have the, the national day for the memories of slavery. These are things which he's going to try and package together to show this nuanced understanding. I think it's important we do read a nuanced understanding of Napoleon's legacy. And we will talk about Napoleon's legacy. This is now a judgment, good or bad, in today's standards. And we will talk about Napoleon's legacy when we come back. Pardon? Stay with us. You're watching the France 24 debate. Welcome back, or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France 24 debate. 200 years to the day after Napoleon died at St. Helena Island, uh, there are commemorations going on and debate and discussion. Uh, we're talking about it with historian Peter Hicks of the Fondation Napoleon Historical Society, the man responsible for all you see on Napoleon.org. Org, correct in uh, the English language uh, web indeed uh, indeed uh, website of that which is absolutely fascinating from Chichester uh, in England we welcome back Andrew Smith senior lecturer in contemporary history and politics at the University of Chichester and um, uh, from uh, Charlottesville Virginia Marlene Doubt uh, associate professor of African diaspora studies at the University of Virginia we were talking about it before the break the France of 1840, when all of Paris turned out to hail the return of Napoleon's remains from St. Helena Island, of course, not the same as the France of 1969 and the bicentennial of Bonaparte's birth or of 2021. Uh, the French divided, you might say, according to political persuasion, to gender and to race. Emerald Maxwell has more. It's the incarnation of the French conqueror an image often promoted by Napoleon's admirers. But they overlook the millions of deaths, between three and six and a half million, according to estimates, that resulted from the expansionist wars he led. After taking power in a coup, Napoleon established a dictatorship, 
Although he gave France its first coherent legal framework, laying the foundations of modern French institutions, his 1802 Civil Code, also known as the Napoleonic Code, would roll back the clock for women after they managed to gain more rights in the first years of the revolution. A married woman suddenly found herself in a powerless position in society. In fact, she couldn't do anything without her husband's permission. She can't go to court without her husband's permission. She can't be a witness. She can't take an exam, get a passport. She can't work without her husband's permission. And moreover, when she does have his permission, it's him who gets the salary. So she doesn't have any more rights than a child. That same year, Napoleon re-established slavery, which had been abolished in France in 1794. Defenders of Napoleon's legacy explained that this was for economic reasons, arguing that the question of human rights didn't arise at the time. The 1802 law was actually discussed at the time, before the legislature and the tribune, and about a third of representatives spoke against the measure. So we can't say that everyone was in agreement. Several dozen lists of grievances had been drawn up in 1789, calling for the abolition of slavery. Despite this, Napoleon sent military expeditions to Guadeloupe and Saint-Domingue, where the local people had won their freedom. A bloody repression was carried out against the indigenous uprisings led by Louis Delgré and Toussaint Louverture. Meanwhile, in France, new racial measures were brought in. C'est la surveillance. It meant the surveillance of people of colour, and as far as possible, sending them back, which often meant sending them back to slavery. It also aimed to prevent mixed unions. Racial and racist laws, which ran counter to the philosophy of the Enlightenment that was spreading throughout Europe at the time. Well, in doubt, you heard there uh, before the break um, Andrew Smith mentioning how in five days' time, France is going to be commemorating the abolition of slavery, and Emmanuel Macron will be front and center for that as well. Uh, in light of how historiography has changed uh, in recent years, how important is this chapter? I mean, the, the chapter of, we just heard about of the restoration of slavery is of the utmost importance. I mean, of course, this happens in 1802, and slavery is not reabolished in France until 1848. So that's 46 really, really long years for enslaved Black people in Martinique and Guadeloupe to continue to be bought and sold like furniture or like cattle. Um, and, and so I think in any discussion, this actually has to be front and center because it's a human story. And to hold up banks and lycée and um, laws and, and proclaim that that set of laws that only benefited white people um, are more important than the other set of laws, the May 1802 law um, permitting Martinique to enter the French Republic as a, as a slave territory, and the July 1802 law reestablishing slavery in Guadeloupe, um, is to suggest that black lives uh, don't actually matter. And so I think we need to uh, push back against this at, at every single moment. And I would also point out that that when the May 1802 law went before the assembly and the legislative body went to vote on it, the vote was 211 for and 63 against. And so with this question of commemoration, who should we commemorate? We should, why don't we know the names of those 63 dissenters? Why are we not talking about all the assembly members from the National Convention in 1794 who voted to abolish slavery? Why are the names of the tyrants, the ones we remember, and the people who get statues, instead of the names of the people like Louis Delgré, who tried to prevent Napoleon from committing the greatest error that any French leader would ever commit? Um, or Toussaint Louverture, and to talk of Napoleon's remains coming back, you know, Toussaint Louverture's remains should also be repatriated to Haiti. Um, and so I think I'll leave it at that for a moment, but I, but I would simply say this is the most important chapter, and it's a chapter that should precede any other when the conversation of Napoleon uh, And do you do you feel, uh, Marlene, that attitudes have evolved and there is growing awareness? We saw, for instance, in 2015, that visit by uh, Emmanuel Macron's predecessor to Haiti, uh, François Hollande, uh, who uh, did apologize and who offered what he himself admitted was a symbolic uh, sum uh, 
uh, for the reparations that the Haitians had been forced to pay over the years for their independence? Um, I think attitudes, I hope attitudes are changing, but I mean, Haiti needs more than symbolic reparations, as Olan said. France, the French government, should definitely pay actual monetary reparations for the indemnity that it imposed in 1825 as a condition of the recognition of Haitian independence, which is widely recognized even by French scholars, for example, Thomas Piketty, um, as having bankrupted the country um, and would stand at a sum between 21 billion and 40 billion U.S. dollars today if France were to repay Haiti with interest. So I think that um, if, in fact, um, popular opinion in France is changing or there's growing awareness of this topic, that the next step is to be able to not just change opinions but put policies into place um, that ensure that actual restitution is made for the victims of what is recognized now as a crime against humanity and was recognized in the era in 1794 and certainly by the Haitians who used that term all the time in the early 19th century um, right after independence to describe all of the things that the French had done um, under slavery and that Napoleon specifically did with the Leclerc expedition and his attempt to bring back slavery. So Peter Hicks, this is this is the because Napoleon, part of the fascination is like Alexander the Great, or uh, he 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 conquered all of Europe, mm -hmm. and he, um, depending on where you go, uh, he's either uh, loved or loathed. If yeah. you go to northern Italy, he's the one who freed them from the Austrians. If you go to Venice, he's the one who ended democracy there. Yeah. Yes, I think Napoleon. Obviously, we're in a we're in a context of early nineteenth century, which two nascent empires are fighting one against the other. It's a, it's a fight to the death. British Empire on the one side, French Empire on the other, if you want to include the Spanish Empire as well, much bigger slave, uh, slaver than, say, France at that time, by a long chalk. But uh, so we've got two major empires fighting each other for in a battle to the, to the, to the death. Napoleon is a military man. He's uh, conducting what one would call um, real politique. So he thinks that by taking French troops to the Caribbean, he can corner the market in sugar, an indigo. He uh, obviously, it was a cat catastrophic mistake, catastrophic failure as well as a mistake. He himself recognized this on St. Helena. So yes, I mean, it, within the context of power politics, that's what happens. And, 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 and with the consequences that uh, Marlene just spoke about. Yes, of course. Well, undeniable. That's what, that's what happened. Um, In his speech that we heard today, the current president, Emmanuel Macron, referenced uh, the painting by Goya, Tres de Mayo, which commemorates the slaughter of prisoners uh, captured in the revolt of 1808 in Madrid. Uh, Napoleon perhaps reviled in Spain, but hailed by the left in Latin America. It was Spain's weakness uh, because of the war with Napoleon that allowed the likes of Simon Bolivar to push for independence for the only trip of his lifetime to Paris in 1995, Cuba's Fidel Castro paid a visit to Napoleon's tomb. Uh, once again, Andrew Smith, it's the question of depending on where you are and where you stand, Napoleon means something completely different to you. I think it's important, yeah, to recognise that there are kind of negotiations that go on in any, you know, historical, political context about the images of the day. We can almost say that Napoleon at some point has become sort of a meme, as it were, an image detached from meaning, which has become in its own way played out to, to meet different sorts of ends. I think it's really important that we look at how that realpolitik, which we've described, those economic necessities, perhaps, those raison d'etat, which people might have talked about, the reality of that was the broken backs of men and women women. And I think it's really important to recognise there is an enormous cost to this. I don't think we should take some sort of, you know, Raskolnikov style idea that great men transgress and there you go, that's it. I think it is massively important that we include and understand the extent of the damage done um, by figures like Napoleon as well. So I we, think it we, is really let, important let, to contextualise that within this discussion. So let me, let me ask you about this, because you, you got, you, you touched on this already in part one of our discussion about there's Napoleon and what he did in his lifetime. And then there's the Napoleon that, the myth that was built afterwards, the 19th century had a name for it. Uh, the ill of the century, le, le mal du siècle. People were nostalgic for Napoleon. You see it in the writing of uh, 
the great authors like uh, Balzac, Stendhal, Victor Hugo. And why is it that the 19th century builds him up so after what you just described, which is all the lives that were lost, uh, the slaughter uh, and, and the, um, the ruthlessness? Well, of course, it has an immediate political context. Um, I mentioned, of course, Napoleon himself was, you know, a fan of writing history, an idea of the study of history. But like many people that wrote at the time, they didn't write their own national history. They telescoped it to talk about the past, the political uh, utility of the moment, and that antiquated past of Rome and Greece and the idea of the classics in that vein. I think that very much becomes the case in the 19th century, where the myth of Napoleon becomes this thing which is telescoped and becomes a way of talking about that present. So during the, the Restoration, he becomes a sort of symbol, an almost Bolivar-like symbol of resistance to that. Years later, he becomes a figure of the right of the military, you know? I think you can see him sitting there in 1921, you know, the idea of him becoming someone who is, you know, a soldier above all. That context changes and you should say the myth evolves. Napoleon in his own life was a mythiculteur, someone who grew and developed myths of this kind of hero saviour image. These ideas about how he kind of, you know, played out these legacies of being a Republican, a general, and somehow a bringer of peace um, at the edge of a bayonet. I think all of these things exist at once. And I think it is really important within that context that we do recognise that this changes over time. And so if right now we are talking more about, you know, ideas of you know, reappraising elements of Napoleon's legacy. It is not rewriting history or, you know, politicizing history or succumbing to political correctness, as they said in 2005 and uh, in memorial times before. Um, I think what this is, is a clear-eyed understanding of France's past, France's national past, and understanding how that touches other countries, like Haiti, um, like, you know, any other kind of, uh, like, you know, Italy, like Spain, the idea of this history, which, you know, Napoleon put his imprint on Europe. And um, that imprint was, in many cases, a bootprint, a bootprint which fell on people's backs and necks. But it was one which carried the French standard at its forefront. France remembers that. France engages with that history. But it also needs, as Emmanuel Macron said, to learn from that history. And I think there is a really important discussion. And I think it's important. We disagree. We have a discussion. And that is, I think, one of the central parts, you know, at the, uh, within this debate. Uh, Peter Hicks. Uh, I suppose when you're at the cafeteria at the Fondation Napoleon, you're the you're the outsider, right? You're the British guy. You can look at this with. Do you get the sense that the fascination with Napoleon here is with uh, the the modernizer, and or is it, you know, a bit like when you root for your team at the Olympics? So here's he's the guy who won on the battlefield, and it's nationalism. Well, I think that's interesting. I think that's more. I think I would have said that reaction was probably more likely during the 19th century. The one with the, he's the guy who won. I think uh, Andrew was very interestingly talking about the the centenary. We've been talking about this today as well. And there was certainly the the idea of Napoleon as the father of the army. Is he's that's how they celebrate 1921. Is they put Napoleon as the sort of the figurehead, the man who, if only he could have whispered in Foch's ear, it would all have gone so much better. Um, that that's an image of Napoleon, but. Yeah, I don't think these days we're like supporting Napoleon because he's like the guy who won. Even Napoleon himself said, I may have won 40 battles, but my coup de civil, 1804, by the way, uh, would be, it was more the thing that he was proud of. And we have to remember that for all its faults, for all its specificities of the early 19th century, the coup de civil of Napoleonic, of which itself grew out of the French Revolution. There were four different codes written at different parts from 1793, 1797, finally 18, 1800 and 1804. The final version is still 40, 50% present in French civil law. So that's interesting. And Napoleon was super proud of that. He participated in a great number of the debates. So I think m people around the cafeteria, around the coffee machine at the Fondation Napoleon, we go like, yeah, that's interesting. That's not a bad thing. We might we might might want to put it in moral terms. Good, bad. I don't know. I'm not sure that's a very good idea. But we would say that was something that created a system that's 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 lasted that people have agreed with. Marlene Dowd on the hashtag F24 debate. Uh, viewers reacting to this question of the Napoleon the reformer versus Napoleon the tyrant. One person said, "Well, can't you be both?" 
Well, I mean, I think it, what, if this was this is a very interesting conversation, right? Because the Code Civil, the much exalted and celebrated Code Civil, we have to remember the vast majority of people, li black people living on the islands of Martinique and Guadeloupe or in Réunion or French Guiana or the other overseas French territories where there was slavery would not benefit from any of those laws. So when we talk about the Code Civil, we are talking about a segregated set of laws. When we talk about the Lycée, when we talk about the Banque Nationale, we're talking about reforms that were largely for white French people. So what is the legacy of that in France today? What is the legacy of that kind of racial segregation, that kind of racial prejudice, which gets instantiated and codified in law. Um, so can a person be both? Well, that certainly depends on whether or not you take into account all of the people who never ever could experience those reforms during Napoleon's own lifetime, that it had to be a subsequent administration, a subsequent revolution in 1848 that would allow people of color and black people to take advantage of the supposed Republican liberties and, and reforms um, that the Code Civil would have allowed at that moment. Andrew Smith, once again, uh, bringing it back to 2021 here, Voters, when you have an election, uh, like we're going to have one here next year, uh, what do they want? They want a strong leader who can be decisive and make decisions. Uh, they also want freedom and uh, their say to be heard and fairness and equity. Are those, those described better Napoleon or the French Revolution that preceded him or neither? <laughs> I think uh, what you got there is a, a kind of a, a big bag of political desires, um, and what they represent are, you know, of course, a million and one things. If if France could agree on uh, those ideas, if any country in the world could agree on those ideas and who and what embodied them, then, of course, we might not have any need for an election. I think that idea of what exactly represents this sense of, you know, you, know, you could use the words of the, those generals, Republican principles and honour would be hotly debated. And I would hazard a guess that many people would not share uh, the same vision of those Republican principles and honour as those generals might themselves in their in their letter. And um, Now, those things are, I think, absolutely up for debate. That idea of the providential leader is, of course, a massively important one. It's one that we can see developing out of, you know, Macron's image, which he presents of himself. But it's also one of the strongest criticisms of Macron, that he's out of touch, that he's, you know, detached from ordinary people and doesn't listen to them. And so, actually, this idea of where sovereignty lies in France, whether it is with the president, whether it is with the Elysee and kind of the idea of a strong French state, whether it is with the idea of popular sovereignty and the French people. We've seen that played out on the streets, you know, many times within the last year or more, as much as we have the last century or more. I think these are questions which do not have a satisfactory answer. And of course, they will not have because defining and redefining those Republican principles is the chief work of the Republic. And I think the, the mission it has is to ensure, as Marlene said already, that this does not exclude people that it ought to include. That idea of the universal speaks to all French citizens and can speak for a greater idea of liberty within that. So what does it mean for 2022? Difficult to say, but you can see Macron essentially, you know, playing with those symbols of the past in order to kind of put out his menu to show himself as a strong leader. And he'll certainly cast himself as a defender of that republic, especially if he gets into a second round debate against Le Pen again. So, um, yeah, potentially playing with those symbols in service of his own uh, political authority. One final question to you, Peter Hicks. When Macron on the campaign trail in 2017 makes that uh, statement about how uh, he pro promising a Jupiterian presidency, I'm not even sure if that's an adjective in English, but mm -hmm. uh, a Jupiter-like uh, presidency, is that a nod to de Gaulle, who founded the current constitution? Or to Napoleon? Well, I think it's impossible to tell. I mean, it's a quite extraordinary remark. I don't know personally whether whether he's referring to de Gaulle or, or, or Napoleon. Napoleon certainly um, wouldn't. I think they use the term Jupiter Scapin about Napoleon in the after the fall of Napoleon in 1815 to say some sort of cheeky god who was just doing what he felt like he could do at, at any particular moment. So that comes out of the black legend, sort of, to refer to Napoleon as Jupiter Scapin. I don't think I, anybody during the Napoleonic period would have referred to Napoleon as Jupiter, so perhaps that pushes us more towards Charles de Gaulle. 
All right. In any case, much more uh, to talk about on this topic. And there's much more, by the way, on our website, France24.com. I want to thank you, uh, Peter Hicks. I want to thank as well uh, Andrew Smith for being with us from Chichester, uh, Marlene Doubt uh, from Charlottesville, uh, Virginia. Thank you for joining us here in the France 24 debate.